Very good evening to everyone here with us today. I extend a warm welcome to each one of you. And I ask my chap to uh, call him. And thank you for taking out the time. Uh, Ma'am, could I request your mic to be muted? I extend a warm welcome to each one of you and thank you for taking out the time to join us today on this virtual platform. It is with great pleasure that I welcome our esteemed guests this evening, Honorable Mr. Justice Sanjay Kishan Kaul, Judge Supreme Court of India, Ms. Zia Modi, founder AZB Partners, Mr. Arvind Datar, senior advocate, Mr. Darais Kambata, senior advocate, and Major General Nilendra Kumar, the editor of the book that we are about to unveil in this function. Rethinking Palkiwala is an anthology of some very insightful and riveting speeches and lectures on a wide array of topics by luminaries in the field of law, politics, journalism, and even economics, to name a few, that were made during the Nani Palkiwala birth centenary celebrations in Delhi between February 2019 and February 2020. I once again welcome you all to be a part of this journey and effort to commemorate the legend that we all know Nani Palkiwala to be. And with that, I call upon Major General Nilendra Kumar, the editor of the book, to enlighten the audience about what Rethinking Palkiwala is all about. Over to you, Major General Kumar. Honorable Mr. Justice Sanjay Kishan Kaul, Judge, Supreme Court of India. Ms. Zia Modi, Founder and Managing Partner, AZB and Partners. Ms. Arvind Tata, Senior Advocate. Mr. Deras Kambata, Senior Advocate. Mr. Vikesh Jani. My greetings to all present. I welcome you all to this web event. I'm very happy to welcome Justice Sanjay Kishan Kaul, Judge Supreme Court of India, the chief guest for today's event. Justice Kaul is a product of Modern School, Barakamba Road, St. Stephen's College, Delhi, and Campus Law Center, Delhi University. He had enrolled as an advocate in 1982. He succeeded soon to set up a busy practice. He used to appear mainly in commercial, civil, writ, original, and company matters before the High Court and the Supreme Court. He was a much sought after advocate on record from 1987 to 1999, was later designated a senior advocate in 1999. He appeared as a senior standing counsel for Delhi High Court, Delhi University, senior panel counsel for the union and the Delhi Development Authority. He was elevated a judge of High Court of Delhi in 2001 he later rose to be the acting Chief Justice of Delhi High Court and finally the Chief Justice of Punjab and Haryana High Court and Madras High Court. He was appointed a judge of the Supreme Court of India on 17th February 2017. Some of his very prominent judgments in the Court of India include the matters like right to privacy in K.S. Putuswami right to peaceful protest, delay in delivery of judgments being violative of Article 21, non-acceptance of delay in computation of limitation period, and the futility of continuing a matrimony that has irretrievably broken down. He is keenly interested in theater, music, 
and golf. I welcome him. I'm happy to introduce our panelists. First in the list is Ms. Zia Modi. She is the founder and managing partner of AZB and Partners. She is counted amongst India's foremost corporate attorneys. She had studied for her law degree at the University of Cambridge and got enrolled as an advocate in 1978. She completed her LLM from Harvard Law School and was then given a membership of the New York Bar, State Bar. She worked as an associate at Baker and McKenzie. Then in 1984, she returned to India to set up law practice by establishing the chambers of Zia Modi. A few years later, it became AZB and Partners. It has offices in Mumbai, Delhi, Bangalore and Pune with over 400 legal professionals. Her special forte is in acquisition, joint ventures, company restructuring, foreign inward investment related matters and corporate law. She was ranked number one in Fortune India's list of 50 most powerful women in business. She's been the deputy chairman and non-executive director on HSBC, Asia Pacific Board, and a member of the World Bank Administrative Tribunal. She served in the Reserve Bank of India's Committee on Comprehensive Financial Services for Small Businesses and Low-Income Households. I thank you, Zia, for your presence here. The next in the list is Mr. Arvind P. Datar. He is a senior advocate of Madras High Court. He is a product of universities of Bombay and Madras. He is also a qualified cost and works accountant. He had joined the bar in 1980. Four years later, he set up his independent practice. He has appeared before various tax tribunals, the company law board, high courts and the Supreme Court. He now has a busy practice in the Supreme Court and usually appears in important cases on taxation and constitutional law. <clears throat> he has authored over 150 articles and four books. These are Datar on the Constitution of India, Guide to Central Excise Law and Practice, Guide to Central Excise Procedures. He has also co-authored The Courtroom Genius along with Mr. Soli Sorabji, this book enumerates the important cases where Mr. Palkiwala had appeared. A few months back, the book titled Essays and Reminiscences, a fast drift in honor of Nani A. Palkiwala, edited by him, was published on the occasion of the birth centenary of Mr. Palkiwala. <clears throat> he is the general editor of Ramayya's Guide to the Companies Act and the chief editor of 11th edition of Kanga and Palkiwala Law and Practice of Income Tax. <clears throat> Mr. Datar is also a visiting faculty at the ICAI, ICSI, ICWA, Bharti Dasam Institute of Management, Traichi, NJA Bhopal, and the Tamil Nadu State Judicial Academy. He is lectured at the Cambridge and Cape Town universities, IIM Kozikode, apart from numerous other universities in India and beyond. He is a founder trustee of the Palkiwala Foundation Chennai and a director of Nani Palkiwala Arbitration Center Chennai. I warmly welcome Mr. Datar. Mr. Darius J. Khambata is a senior advocate, holds an LLM from Harvard Law School and practices before Supreme Court of India, the Bombay High Court and a number of other high courts and tribunals across India. He has held two very distinguished law offices. He was the additional solicitor general for three years and then the advocate general of Maharashtra from 2012 to 14. He is a member of SEBI's takeover panel and was earlier part of its committee. Framing of new insider trading. Mr. Khambata has been a vice president of the Court of International Arbitration and is currently a arbitration center's court. He also sits on the advisory council to the National Law University, Mumbai. My welcome to you, sir. I further greet Mr. Vikesh Dhani. He is the co and director of Oak Bridge Publishing. He comes with over 
23 years leadership in the publishing sphere. His strong forte is in driving sales, marketing, and innovation. At Oakbridge, he spearheads strategic business development, strategic alliances, and partnerships. Welcome, Vikesh. The period January 2019 to January 2020 was celebrated as Nani Palkiwala birth centenary year. A number of Palkiwala lectures, panel discussions, debates and quizzes on constitutional law were held during the birth centenary year. The participants and speakers were serving and former judges of the Supreme Court, eminent advocates, renowned jurists, senior diplomats, leading journalists, activists, elder politicians, and the themes and topics chosen for the discussion were diverse and topical. To illustrate, these pertain to the rule of law and role of free citizens, a borrowed constitution, fact, an overview of the arbitration landscape in India, what should the lawyers and other professionals be doing today? A slavish regard for the rule of law, education, and multinational liability in Nani Palkhiwala's worldview, dignity in the constitutional context, a judicial overview, can dynasty and democracy coexist, the law of the state and the state of law, and women's security at workplace, a challenge to India's development. There was also a session in Hindi on Bharti, Dharm, or Samvidha. One of the events saw a panel discussion where they from three different spheres who reminisced about Nani Palkhiwala. They looked at him from a soldier's perspective, a diplomat's viewpoint and an assessment by a leading economist. This book has compiled all the speeches, the panel discussions, and the debates, etc. The underlying aim is to reach out to a larger audience, and particularly the youth. It is to show them how relevant are these topics in the backdrop of role and contribution of Nani Palkhiwala, a great son of India. I request Prerna Priyadarshini, Advocate on Record, Supreme Court, and the compere for this event to proceed with the book launch ceremony. Thank you. Thank you, sir. On that note, I would request Honorable Justice Sanjay Kishan Call, Judge Supreme Court of India, to unveil and officially release the book Rethinking Palkiwala. Sir, I could just request you to maybe place the book so that it's visible to our audience. Thank you so much, sir. May I now request Honorable Mr. Justice Sanjay Kishin called to share his thoughts on the book on today's occasion. A very good evening, uh, Ms. General Milendra Kumar, founder and director of Lex Concilium Foundation, Zia Modi, uh, founder of AZB and partner, senior advocates, Ms. Tarun Datar and Mr. Daraj Sambata, Mr. Vivek Diani, and everyone else ends joining uh, in the new method of virtually so. Uh, I'm delighted to join in your company for the release of the centenary uh, commemorative volume of the book Rethinking Palkiwala, which is a meticulous compilation of discussions, lectures, debates, and more organized between 2019 and 2020 by the Lex Concilium Foundation as part of Mr. Nani Palkiwala's year-long birth centenary celebrations. The launch of this book evokes the memory of not just a great legal luminary, but of an individual who donned several hats. Mr. Palkiwala is at once remembered as a formidable lawyer, a taxation expert, an economist, a diplomat, a corporate leader, 
and an orator par excellence. He was immensely influential in the development of a strong sense of constitutional morality early in our jurisprudence, be it while arguing landmark constitutional cases in court or while teaching law to students as a lecturer at the Government Law College, Bombay. His deep respect for constitutional principles convinced him of the strength of the Constitution to survive the vagaries of time. This is perhaps best reflected in what is often acknowledged as his favorite quotation attributed to the great American jurist Joseph Story. The Constitution has been reared for immortality. If the work of a man may it may nevertheless perish in an hour by the folly or corruption or negligence of its only keepers, the people. His magnum opus, The Law and Practice of Income Tax, was groundbreaking achievement that first appeared over 70 years ago. To date, it continues to be an important reference point for the students and professionals alike and has received widespread critical acclaim. In addition to having a brilliant academic career, Mr. Palkiwala was a public speaker par excellence, capable of delivering speeches on the most complex topics with great ease. The hallmark of his ability to set forth the most complex legal problems before the court in a manner which was simplistic with illustrations from day-to-day -day life. His annual budget speech were of great renown, where it is a thing of legend that he would speak without notes, recite elaborate facts and figures from memory. Lawyers, businessmen, industrialists, and the common man all sat in the audience, enthralled by his genius. It may not be an overstatement to say that of the two budget speeches delivered every year by the finance minister and Mr. Palkiwala, his was the more anticipated one. Perhaps the most remarkable thing of Mr. Palkiwala's illustrious career is despite his staggering success and legendary accomplishments, he was never consumed by his ego. This was stated most elegantly in an essay penned down by Mr. Soli Surabji after Mr. Palkiwala passed away where Mr. Suraji wrote, I quote, he was tender towards the bashful, gentle towards the distant, and merciful towards the absurd. It is a testament of his humility and modesty that he is today remembered so fondly for qualities of head and heart. It's a truly story of humble beginning, material rise and success in unwavering intellectual integrity. This book, therefore, suitably titled Rethinking Palkiwala, is a commendable undertaking in keeping the spirit, legacy, and memory of a towering public personality alive. Lex Concilium Foundation, under the able leadership of Major Lirend Kumar, has pioneered the innovative and effective work on several fronts. The centenary celebrations observed by way of a series of activities modeled on the life and work of Mr. Palkiwala and aim towards the young entrance into the field are a valuable and meaningful contribution to legal academy, and if I may say so, legal innovation. It is especially heartening to learn of formats such as debates and quizzes having been organized, which provided an added impetus to the young minds to engage with the law. This year of celebration has culminated in this book, We Now Hold, and we must commend both the foundation and Major General Narendra Kumar painstaking efforts as the editor of the book. The themes covered in the book span across the length and breadth of the constitutional and political landscape of the country. Contributions from across the bar, the bench, academia, and public life have ensured an enriching interdisciplinary discourse on carefully curated subjects. Incorporation of discussions on the arbitration landscape in India and women's security at the workplace are a testament to the commitment of this project to constructively engage with the pressing challenges and opportunities of our times. Equally heartening to note is that the book has not hesitated in crossing the language barrier and has incorporated lectures delivered in Hindi on the compelling topic, Haritya Rajya, Dharm or Samvidhan. The varied voices that find expression in this book cross political and ideological divides.
serving as an important reminder of Mr. Palkiwala's firm belief in the supremacy of rule of law and his faith in the people as a unit being the ultimate custodian of the constitution and its values. In conclusion, and as modest tribute to Mr. Palkiwala's when no love for literature, I would like to end on a literary note. Invoking words of American poet Henry Wedsworth Longfellow from his poem, Chasm of Life. Life of great men all remind us we can make our lives sublime and departing leave behind us footprints in the time. Who think that perhaps another sailing a life solemn main, a fallen and shipwrecked brother, seeing shall take heart again. Let us then be up and doing with a heart for any fate, still achieving, still pursuing, learn to labor and wait. Mr. Palkiwala would have completed 100 years on January 16, 2020. And I think it is most befitting that the legal community has come together to observe this occasion, share memories, and imbibe lessons of life that has left an in indelible excellence. Mark, I congratulate Major Lenin Kumar and all the esteemed contributors for their commendable achievement in bringing to fruition this most apt homage and compliments to the Oaks Bridge publication and all those involved in providing support and bringing the initiative to life. This book is an invaluable addition to the legal scholarship and rare coming together of the best of minds. I am certain that it will hold a prized position in the bookshelves of many years to come. On a slightly different note, let us think what would have been the lack of contribution in so many fields, but a great addition to the judiciary if he had joined where he was offered one supposition. Once again, a very good evening and thank you all. Thank you so much, Justice Call, for those kind words. We really hope the book serves the purpose with which it has been brought out. And rightly, it is difficult to speak of Nani Palkiwala without using superlatives for his intellect, character, oration, amongst other qualities. Rightly called a man of many sterling qualities, there are facets of his character that are particularly inspirational for the young minds. I would now request Ms. Zia Modi to tell our audience some more about these inspirational qualities that all of us here today would like to hear, would like to know from you, ma'am. I think we're facing some uh, issue. Ma'am, are you here? Good. She sent a chat message that she just can't get in. Oh. That's, that's, I think, an earlier message of hers, I think. I see, I see. But she's obviously having a problem in getting in again. Maybe. You ask her to try the iPhone again. Yeah. Uh, or, or maybe Mr. Good. Could we? So that I can begin till she, uh, till she manages to reconnect. Good afternoon to all of you, and it's a privilege to be on this panel with Justice Sanjay Kishan Paul, my dear friend Daras, and Zia as well. Uh, when I was asked to speak on this uh, platform, the organization is Lex Concilium Foundation. It says enabling young minds. So I thought that I'll speak on what his life meant for young lawyers because ultimately what we need at all times are good role models which the younger lawyers can eliminate can emulate uh unlike darais and zia i was not in bombay high court so i had very little chance of uh, uh, meeting him as often i met him only a few times i heard him in the madras income tax tribunal on a very very important issue which by a coincidence ultimately i argued in the supreme court almost 20 17 years later for that. 
and in fact i got i have could appear in the supreme court because he had become very old by then he had a lot of series of strokes and uh, when the matter initially came to the madras high court we wanted to brief him but that same month uh, mr jyadi tata mr jyadi tata had passed away and so he couldn't attend the hearing in madras so my contacts with him were just few meetings off and on and uh, the only thing was throughout my college in bombay and also in madras later i made it a point to attend all his lectures not only on the budget he gave other lectures as well uh in he passed away in uh, i think 2002 and soon after he passed away we we had started the palkiola foundation in chennai and the first lecture was given by so mr soli sorabji at his lecture and i on a personal note i remember that mr sorabji is wearing a slightly unusual tie and when we took him to the dais and uh, he started speaking then he said that i am wearing this tie as palkiola's junior this was the first tie he gave me when i joined the bar and he had kept it and he wore it again so it was a nice a personal touch after that um, the palkiola memorial trust in mumbai decided to commission two books one was his biography which was done by mv kamath and the other they felt that somebody should make a compilation or at least a brief chronicle of all his important cases he had appeared in so many landmark cases we hear of kesan bharati but there are so many other ones in fact uh, when this book was first written mr sorab ji called me and uh, i went to delhi and he said that why don't you and i co-author this book on behalf of the memorial trust and that's how i started uh, getting into his life and understanding more of what he did and eventually he wrote this uh, kotum genius with mr Sur- mr suri suraj ji and the interest that people have for the man is manifested by the fact that when we first wrote the book and it was published by lexis normally typically a law book runs to about 2000 pages per edition they are not high say the books are not sold beyond that number 2000 maximum 4000 but it is perhaps a tribute to the continuing interest that his life has that this book has in 2020 january had finished 17 reprints and had published more than 35000 copies had been sold so this was perhaps the popularity of the man and the sign that young lawyers wanted to learn about his life so that they could also learn from him now in the course of writing this book uh, mr sorab ji and i initially he gave me a list of people to interview and i interviewed many people who were his contemporaries just as yv chandrachu both started the their practice together both were teaching at the law college i had said three or four interviews with him i interviewed mr anil divan mr andir rajna sadly many of them are no more dm popat or mulla and mulla had a large number of interviews uh, with him the most important of course was his brother bairam palkiola was very attached to him and was also his co-author from from the beginning right from day one he wrote the magnum opus along with him and as i kept writing this book i then realized that uh, there's something very special here and i used to ask myself the question that there are successful people there are very successful people and there are some in this at the almost at the stratospheric level you know who and i was wondering what makes a person reach that very very rarefied atmosphere and when i interviewed mr fali nariman he gave a very good example he said there are many batsmen of the hops class but there are just a very few who belong to the bradman class and it was palkiwala who reached that ultimate thing and then i was asking myself the question what gave him those qualities and those of you who can read the book in chapter 1 i have tabulated those uh, qualities before i tell you uh, i after discussing with major general kumar i decided to topic uh, title this topic as lessons for young lawyers so maybe it could be something which other young members of the audience can learn and who will definitely be the leaders and perhaps the palkiolas of the future uh one other important thing was that uh, as just as call mentioned like you know there are a lot of ifs if this had happened what would happen and if palkiola was offered the judgeship at the age of 37 even if he had taken it say 40 he would have had perhaps a 20 25 year stint as the judge would definitely be in the chief justice but he didn't take it i was told that he didn't want to leave bombay he also offered the post of attorney general uh, more than once and his brother told me that uh, he was restless at that night and the next morning he felt that he should take it up and he told the law minister going men that he is not taking it up so this was the thing. the other part before i mention those five six qualities was that uh, when his 100th uh, birth centenary was to be celebrated the trust formed a committee headed by justice sujata manohar 
just as Variava was there, Mr. Ma- Maligaon and uh, Mr. H.P. Ranina, his nephew, and myself, we formed a committee. And we decided to publish a fresh trip, a collection of his articles. Uh, what was fascinating was that uh, these documents were with Behram, his brother first, and then they were sent to the Tata archives in Pune. Those, if you get a chance, please go to the Tata archives. It's a lovely museum. And uh, with the help of uh, trustees of the Tata Memorial Trust, I got a chance to go to the archives. And you'll be surprised to note that there are 73 acid-proof boxes containing all his correspondence, which is completely tabulated in Excel sheets and now under the process of digitization. And it was a fascinating research. I spent, uh, I went to Pune and spent time there to read these written submissions in Keshav Bharati, written submissions in the Privy Purses case and so on. The amount of letters, and the letters are numerous to prime ministers, to ministers and so on and so forth. It was really a fascinating, fascinating journey. And in the course, I realized that, yes, and one most important thing was, uh, we have all seen his uh, articles and books on law and so on. It so happened that his knee, his grandniece, uh, Statira Ranina, came across an old box in his house, which contained a lot of his articles. And believe me, if you ever get the chance to buy the or see this book on uh, essays and remnants, ignore everything else. Just go to the chapter where he's written articles as a young, uh, young 19-year-old boy, a 20-year-old boy. And the kind of uh, piece he has written on Charles Dickens, on uh, Oliver Goldsmith, on Hardy is unbelievable, his young essays. And he also had a column called This and That, and he would write on everything. And it's quite interesting that he was fascinated with Churchill. He was a great admirer of Mahatma Gandhi. All these things come out. One thing I learned was his literary output was prodigious. I mean, the kind of essays he wrote, and just the essays which he wrote from 19, the age of 19 till about 30, run to more than 480 pages of uh, printed material, which we have typed out and kept, and we have great difficulty in selecting those things. So now what are the lessons what young lawyers can learn? And I just tabulated just four of uh, six or seven of them. The first lesson which I thought was that disadvantages don't really matter. Disadvantages don't matter. I mean, you can have, uh, uh, you can come, take Palkiola, for example, his father ran a laundry. Uh, he was in a middle class background. He they lived in a small apartment in Tardev. Uh, and from that, he just came up. He first wanted to be a lecturer, which he couldn't succeed. And then he had a huge stammer. And his brother Bairam tells me that he was determined to overcome that. And despite the stammer at a young age, he took part in every possible elocution competition. And of course, as you know, he then became one of the best orators India has seen. So he was able to overcome these things with tremendous amount of uh, courage. Second lesson which I could tell youngsters is that success is not accidental. In fact, the famous athlete Carl Lewis once said that success is not easy. It was easy, everybody would be successful. So success is not accidental. It, I found throughout the interviews and particularly in long conversations with his brother Bairam that he, he was an extraordinarily determined person to succeed at everything he attached his hand on. He joined law college after he decided that he couldn't be a lecturer in English. He joined the government law college Bombay. And then in the first and second year, he stood first, first class first. And his record is that both the years, he not only stood first, but stood first in each and every individual subject. So that's his record, which will perhaps be surpassed, but cannot be equal. So that was his continuous drive. Even when he wanted to write a debate, he would practice and practice and practice. So this phenomenal single-minded determination to succeed was important thing. So I would say, one, that disadvantages don't matter. Second, that success is not accidental. It requires a tremendous amount of work. And the third was the single-minded uh, devotion to the profession. I see that he joined the bar in 1946, and by 1950, he was commanding a huge income. Uh, the Madras High Court records that by 1949, in three years' time, his income was 50,000 rupees a year in that year, which I think is an astronomical sum in those days. A uh, few of you know that once he decided to practice in income tax, you see, there's also, he took advantage of all the opportunities he came. He didn't let, let, let any opportunity slip by. Uh, not many of you know that the income tax tribunal came in 1941. His senior was Sir Jamshed Ji Kanga, who was a leading, uh, who was the Advocate General. And it was the practice in the Bombay High Court that the Advocate General does income tax matters. So when he retired, when he stepped down, he obviously didn't go to the tribunal. And Palkiola got the chance to go to the tribunal. 
Now, in terms of accounts, he took classes in the evening and learned accounts from his former principal, Banaji. So there also he was completely focused on the subject and he and his, he decided to write a book. And uh, as you know, there was another book by Sampatanga, who then sued him in the Madras High Court for uh, breach of copyright. The entire plaint, the written statement and the judgment by Justice Panchavake Shahir is there. It's a beautiful judgment. We have reproduced it in the book. And Mr. Sirwa appeared for him, incidentally. And you'll be surprised that initially the court granted interim injunction. The sale of the book had stopped. But subsequently, the, they succeeded. And then the book went on to become the authority commentary. What Baram told me was, he said, once he decided to practice in taxation, he decided to write a book which became the absolute last word on the subject. So he immersed himself completely in that. And I have always told my young colleagues that one way of advancing in practice is if you can write articles or write books on your domain expertise, it would be greatly helpful. Secondly, he uh, really, really focused on the income tax aspect. I mean, there are cases where appeared in the writ court and there are some, the research I saw, he did some lot of matters on Article 226. There were a lot of issues on the requisition, Land Requisition Act Many refugees had come to Bombay, properties were acquisitions. We had challenged that. Surprisingly, appeared in a few habeas corpus cases. But by and large, he completely focused mainly on uh, taxation. So one possible thing is that you choose one subject, you specialize as much as you can, and you can always do a few subjects here and there. But it's better to have one subject where you're the absolute master or your domain expertise there. Because there should be something which distinguishes you from the rest of the crowd if you want to get ahead in the path. The next point which I realized was that I was told by many people, including Mr. Ander Rujana, Mr. Dinesh Vyas, Dinesh Popat and that he planned his cases very well. I mean, like, for example, in the case of Bharati case, every proposition would be written out. I mean, he had a writer's cramp. I've seen that when I met him also, he would write like this. He could hold his pen and all his exams were written with the help of a writer. So he couldn't write. He would hold his pen in like this and write. But despite that, he would write out his proposition and per proposition, they would be what is the authority is going to put the Indian authorities, the US authorities for case and and the other commentary. So everything was meticulously planned. And Vyas tells me that in the income tax matters also, that was very, very critical to, to plan the work. And one approach he took was he always tried to find out, suppose the opposite view is taken, what would be the consequence? And then he would try to tell the judge that, look, if you take the opposite view, this is the possible consequence. The other thing which surprised me was that uh, he believed in uh, uh, reading a lot of management literature, which is news to me. M.R. Pai, who was the president of the Forum of Free Enterprise, and was, and M.R. Pai told me that apart from his wife, he spent the most time with him because they were always traveling for lectures and so on and so forth. Uh, Palkiwala was a great admirer of Peter Drucker. He uh, spent a lot of time mastering speed reading, and I believe he would uh, read very quickly, very fast. He was very, very interested in theories of time management. These are all things which I got to know when I interviewed people and I uh, spoke to a number of people. So he always believed in continuously improving himself, either through speed reading or time management, which is remarkable despite being a very successful lawyer. He always did that. And finally, I would say that uh, what mattered to him was his obsession with time. He's continuously obsessed with uh, time and didn't like to waste a single minute. Uh, uh, Mr. U.R. Lalit, just Lalit's father told me that he had briefed him in a matter and the conference was fixed for 15 minutes. The matter was over in two minutes, three minutes. So Mr. Palkula just there were no niceties, no other thing. He just got up, said thank you, took him to the road and that was it. So, and Baram tells me that after his conferences, he would come straight to their house and they would immediately start writing. So he has a great obsession with uh, time. And as uh, Justice Cole remarked that he was very uh, humble and courteous. I can tell you from personal experience, uh, he was always very polite and very courteous and no letter to him went unanswered within two to three days. That was the most remarkable thing. Uh, and throughout, and I spoke to other people, one important quality which young lawyers can remember is the extremely quick turnaround of, to send him an opinion, it would come back in 10, 12 days, any letter would be answered immediately and so on and so forth. So these are the broad lessons. And one thing is very clear that if we follow the steps which he followed, that is to say that you have, uh, don't worry about your disadvantages, plan your life very well, work extremely hard, believe in continuous improvement, and so on and so forth. Success is virtually guaranteed. It is said that success leaves clues. And if you follow something which a role model has done, 
the odds are very bright that you will achieve the same success. Uh, Justice Call ended with the quotation, and I also will just send, uh, make two quotations which we have produced in the book on courtroom genius, and which are particularly important to young lawyers. That if you got a role model, you follow his path, you also will achieve success. If you aim for the stars, you may not reach the star, but at least you will reach the moon. And I just end with two quotations: one by Abraham Lincoln, that some achieve great success is proof to all that others can achieve it as well. And the other one of my favorites is that every great example takes hold of us with the authority of a miracle and says to us, if you have faith, you also could do the same things. Thank you very much. And I wish everybody all the very best, particularly all the youngsters who are in the audience. I wish you all success in your career. And may you work very hard. And I look forward to seeing the Palkiolas of the coming generation. Thank you so much. God bless. Thank you so much, sir. I'm sure those were some really fascinating details that not many of us were aware of. It's not just amazing to hear Nani Palkiwala's story, but your journey of research on Nani Palkiwala is equally inspiring, sir. With that, if we uh, have Ms. Zia Modi back with us, I would request her to address the audience. Ma'am, are you here? Zia, can you hear us? I can't hear. Ma'am, could you address the audience if you're back with us? Uh, yes, I can hear you, but to hear you, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am, you're audible. Can, can you hear me? You are audible. I'm. I don't know if you can. <laughs> You're audible, ma'am. Could we request you to go ahead? I think there is again a problem. Shall I speak? Yes, uh, yeah. Zia, can you hear us, all of us? We can hear you. You can proceed. Yes, yes, we can hear you. I'm afraid we can we can try again after maybe uh, yeah. this, this. yes I'm afraid she's not able to hear us clearly perhaps I think maybe after yeah. the rest we can try once more yeah. may I request uh, Mr. Darais come advocate to speak a few words about Nani Palkiwala and his continued relevance in modern India and the issues that we are currently faced with certainly thank you Perna uh, Justice Sanjay Kishan Kaul, Arvind Zia, Major General Vikesh Prerna, and friends. Rethinking Palkiwala is the name of this excellent compendium that the Major General has edited and brought out. And I think it will become an invaluable companion to any young citizen of our country. Because when the history of Indian democracy, particularly during the latter half of the 20th century is written, it will be, to my mind, impossible to equal, much less to surpass, the contribution of Nani Palkiwala, always known as Nani to the Bombay Bar. His impact not only on law, taxation, economics, 
but also on the very fabric of Indian democracy was both meteoric and is indelible. Now he came to the Bombay Bar in a storm. He, he came as a prodigious <laughs> talent, as you've heard, into the chambers of Jamsedji Kanga. And he took the bar by storm. He was like a virtual hurricane of activity. He rushed and to the top of the bar very, very quickly. But I believe he was much more than arguably the greatest lawyer India has ever produced. He came to the bar during an epoch, we must remember, which had already witnessed several greats. You had the immense legal intellect and clarity of his own senior, the Jamsedji Kanga, who became the doyen of the Bombay Bar, and who, of course, in turn had a whole galaxy of juniors, including Palkhiwal and H.M. Sirvai. And Sir Harilal Kanya, the first Chief Justice of Independent India, amongst others. You had the two settlers, Sir Chiman Lal, had just passed away a few years before, and his son Motilal, again, play great clarity of thought and precision of argument, phenomenal legal skills. And you had just had the great Bulabai Desai, the legendary Bulabai Desai, who could have been India's first prime minister, but that's a story for another day. You had, at the time Palkhiwala was practicing, you had the great Vishwanath Shastri and Ashok Sen, who were also gifted with photographic memories for case law, as was Jamsedji Kanga. You had constitutional scholars like H.M. Sirvai, M.K. Nambiar. You had great orators like Bulabai Desai, C.K. Daftari, masters over the English language like Kanailal Mishra, Sirvai himself, whose recall and declamation of poetry and prose was second to none. Yet with all this, why is it that we constantly repeat Nani's name? And why does he, in my opinion, tower above them all? His qualities are very well known, and Arvind has spoken of them, but I would single out three. He, of course, had a razor sharp intellect of immense depth and backed with a humongous knowledge of law, history, and literature. But it was his clarity of thought and the assembling of a structured argument of perfect logical symmetry that was his hallmark. The very simplicity of his submission gave it irresistible force before a court. When he argued, all before him, including the judge, were mesmerized. There was simply no other way of looking at the problem than the way Palkiwala put it. His submissions in Kesavananda are worth seeing. Arvind is right, and it's a great service he's done to bring them out. They are a prime example of how all the clutter and irrelevance of a legal argument is ejected. And there is a clear, simple, and irresistible line of argument that is produced. So that was his great first quality. His second quality was what I would call persuasiveness. Now, persuasiveness is far wider and a greater quality than mere oratory or eloquence. It includes the content of the argument, the language in which it is placed, the points that are put first, and what points are put next. And his advocacy was always underpinned by the clarity of his thought. The words he chose were simple, direct, and he could reduce the most complex proposition to the simplest and most obvious conclusion. I mean, take his encapsulation of his argument in challenge of the 42nd Amendment, which had amended Article 368 after Kesavananda to give Parliament mm -hmm. unlimited power of amendment. He ultimately put it like this, that if parliament had the power to destroy the basic structure of the constitution, then a creature of the constitution would become its master. I mean, in one sentence, he encapsulated what was a very complex series of submissions and arguments. And that was the essence of the matter. And such simplicity won over judges and indeed bowled over opponents. And the third quality, and I think this must never be underestimated, was his preparation and hard work. He was a cornucopia of knowledge himself. He had it all in his head, and yet immense labor went into everything he did. For his budget speech, for example, the moment the budget was pronounced, he would apparently barricade himself for two days in Bombay House 
with just three or four of his assistants or juniors to prepare his speech. And what a speech that always was. Justice Call has rightly noted that the speech was often more anticipated than the budget itself. I remember going to those speeches, some of them, as a college student. I knew nothing about economics. I knew even less about law. I was not a great student of literature, prose or poetry. But you went there and that speech was like a master class. It was sheer, pure entertainment. And yet it was always structured. It was always underpinned by an irrefutable logic. And it was strewn with quotations of poetry, prose, examples from his history. You, you came out of that with huge amounts of wisdom. And as we have seen on the cover of this book, ultimately that speech was given in the Brabant Stadium and crowds, bigger than crowds for test matches attended. We all went. It was a big event that evening, two days after the budget in Bombay. His dream was free enterprise. And I think that got inculcated in a large measure after he joined Tata Sons as a director. And of course, thereafter, he became deputy chairman. But at that time, you must remember, he was in a hopeless minority. His was a lone voice in the wilderness because the order of the day was Fabian socialism and populist socialism. That had a huge appeal. Indira Gandhi was at the peak of her powers. Nationalism of private enterprise, of property, regulation of the economy, land sealing laws, socialist dogma was the mood of the hour. His was a lone voice. And he fought his battle with logic and reason alone. And all through, he remained dignified, utterly convinced of his purpose and humble. I remember his humility and courtesy personally, even to me. Our families had known each other. He had known my grandfather who was a solicitor. So when I was applying to go abroad for my master's, my father took him to me on the revered fourth floor of Bombay house. The moment he met us, he went into reminiscence of my grandfather, how they shared a love for philosophy, religion, etc. And then he was kind enough to give me a reference, which I used uh, with the Harvard Law School. And that reference also was short, precise, but every word was weighty. And I treasure that to this day. I have a copy of it to this day. He personally then escorted us out to the lift. And this was nothing new. He did it to everybody. When you went to his house for dinner, apart from the warmth of his hospitality that he and Nageshanti always gave us, he would personally serve the guests. He would personally see that everyone had been fed. And then he would escort people very often down to their cars. But invariably, at least to the lift, he would always be there. That was the humility of the man. He should have been finance minister in 1977 when the Janta government came to power. That was an opportunity lost. Had we had him then, I suspect we would have had in 1977 the economic revolution that Dr. Manmohan Singh gave us in 1991. But it was not to be, and the nation was the loser. But I, in some way, believe that it was his clarion call given every year from the 1950s, clarion call in the desert that Dr. Manmohan Singh heard in 1991. What drove Nani and what made him stand apart from the others? He turned every disadvantage into an advantage. And I think Arvind made a very good point on this. A stammer was turned into eloquence. A writer's cramp was turned into a photographic memory and a talent for exquisite prose. And poverty, for he was very poor. He had to even study under street lamps. He didn't, there was no place at home. He had to go out and study under street lamps. So poverty, he turned into a wealth of knowledge and learning. His unique combination of industry and idealism had already converted him to the belief, of course, that a free and unregulated economy could make India rise from the ravages of colonialism and poverty. But his epiphany went well beyond that. I think what focused his unshakable credo was that the bedrock of a free economy was one and one alone, and that was a free society. Without a constitutional democracy that was protective of civil liberties, 
Nani believed there could never be a flourishing economy, an improvement of the lot of millions of the poorest. Because a vibrant economy, he always felt, required innovation and entrepreneurship, and that could come only from liberty and freedom. He was steeped in philosophy, theology. He had a deep understanding of Vedanta. There was this almost divine spark in him and a conviction that the state control of the marketplace of ideas and thoughts was as counterproductive as state control of business. The two freedoms were intertwined and could not be divorced. And I think this one conviction, this one message is his greatest legacy. And it is to this single minded purpose that he devoted himself entirely and selflessly. Again, Arvind has given the example of returning home every night, going on till about two in the morning every day, writing his book, flying back for one day to make an argument in the Golaknath case when he was appearing for the Union of India in an international tribunal in Geneva. He used to come back every weekend from that tribunal in days when international travel was not that easy. He would come back to clear his table. Go back on the Sunday evening. He eschewed high office. He turned down offers of judgeship to the Supreme Court and twice of attorney generalship. And his anxiety was always to remain apolitical outside politics. But his duty and devotion to his country was never in doubt. Even when it was expected he'd be offered finance ministership in 77. And everyone was disappointed that he was overlooked. He accepted the far humbler office of ambassadorship to the US. And his Midas touch transformed that office. He gave two or three hundred speeches. He went all over the US. He explained to them the value of India's civilization, culture, and its constitutional democracy. And I think he evoked what was like a kindred spirit in them. And he harnessed that to India's advantage. Even when he returned, after the fall of the Janta government, and by then he had been honored with doctorates from Princeton and other universities, he immediately wrote to Indira Gandhi, offering his services to continue his persuasion of US senators to support continuation of nuclear material supplies to India. She had, of course, been his implacable foe in the early 70s, and he heard of his client and a client whose brief he had returned in protest against the emergency declaration. But he nevertheless thought in the interest of his country, he had to make this offer. To him. His patriotism and devotion echoed Mark Twain's definition, I believe, of patriotism. Support your country all the time and your government when it deserves it. His greatest legacy, as I said, was his vision of freedom of the individual that he so valiantly fought for. Liberty not only of the entrepreneur, but also of the civil libertarian, a true freedom. And I firmly believe that the credo of Nani's quest for freedom still lights the lamp that burns in the heart of every aspirational Indian today. Every citizen, every boy and girl who dreams of a better future burns that flame of freedom. That flame, I believe, shall never die. And it is Nani's greatest legacy for which we should be eternally grateful that he kept that flame burning at the most difficult time. Thank you very much for having me here. Thank you so much, sir. We really hope we are able to keep that flame burning, especially the young India. I think every time we hear someone speak about and of Nani Palkiwala, the charisma around the man only multiplies manifold. On that note, I think we will try and get Ms. Zia Modi one more time with us. Ma'am, if you're able to hear us, could we request you to proceed? I think she's trying her best to fix things and get back with us. Meanwhile, could we proceed with the address by Mr. Vikesh Theani, the co-founder and director of Oakbridge Publishing, which has very graciously agreed to bring this volume out in print for all of us.
मिस्टर ध्यानी
so I decided that uh, it was just not open for me to be Mr. Pakiwala Jr. And I switched to a more realistic type of practice, which I then uh, worked on along with the Raj and many other juniors that are now doing so well today. Uh, so I would think that the lesson or the or the uh, the thoughts that I would give to the audience of young, passionate lawyers out there is persevere, don't stop. And the only way you can persevere is if you have the passion in you to last the distance. It is a tough profession and it is not easy to endure. Failures are more than successes, especially in the earlier times. But if you have the passion, all that gets overcome distance than it otherwise would. Uh, you know, the other, the last thought that I would leave you with is uh, Mr. Parkiwala's fierce commitment to the rule of law. And we have seen from the book and from the reality and history will, I think, no doubt not forget how he defended the freedom of speech and the rights that we enjoy today. Uh, as a Baha'i by religion, one of our major commandments is where our prophet tells us the best beloved in my sight is justice and that i think translates into a large part of what mr parkiwala's life was all about fighting for justice fighting for freedom of expression and making sure that the rule of law endured and that all of us and hopefully generations to come can take the benefit of very strong seeds he had sown so uh, thank you for this opportunity and for the audience in uh, uh, to all of you. This was a living legend uh, when Mr. Palkiwala was alive. Um, uh, he, he stays as a legend for even the future. But when he was there, I think every decade where he contributed to the democracy of our country made him a one special person that none of us should ever forget. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, ma'am, for making that effort to be with us despite all odds. Thank you so much. That that amazing story of perseverance and unflinching determination is what we often need to hear and be inspired by. On that note, I request Mr. Vikesh Dhyani, co-founder and director, Oak Bridge Publishing, to speak a few words. Thank you, Prerna. Uh, I'm I'm conscious that uh, Mr. Datar has to leave for a meeting, so I'll make it very quick. Uh, I would uh, I would you know uh, like to extend a very warm welcome to all our esteemed guests uh, today on the panel, Honorable Mr. Mr. Sanjay Kishankar, and all our guests of honor, Ms. Zia Modi, Mr. Ravind Datar, Mr. Darius Kambata, and the editor of the book, Major General Nilendra Kumar. Uh, also, uh, I would like to thank all our audiences uh, who are attending this event live across multiple social media channels. Uh, we are truly privileged and we feel honored on this momentous occasion to celebrate the legendary Mr. Nani Palkiwala, his thoughts, his persona, and his lessons. A strong proponent of constitutional values, Mr. Palkiwala's contributions in the fields of law, tax, and governance have left an indelible mark on the various facets of Indian polity, law, and governance systems. Most importantly, his thoughts and lessons continue to be relevant and applicable even in today's context as they continue to inspire generation after generation. We are thankful to Major General Ilendra Kumar for chronicling the year-long events that were organized as part of the birth centenary celebrations, conceptualized by the Lex Concilium Foundation and supported by several other professionals, institutions, and organizations. The impressive list of over 50 eminent contributors in the book includes who's who from the various fields of law, judiciary, polity, bureaucracy, economics, and media and journalism. Accordingly, the readers will find the book very useful as Nani Palkiwala, the persona, emerges through the lectures, debates, discussions on a variety of themes and topics that are still relevant and very important today. It's a well-known fact that nations and economies that tend to do well have robust legal, judicial, and governance systems. At Oakbridge Publishing, it is our endeavor to publish high-quality works from stalwart authors with a view to enable professionals to succeed in their profession and with the larger purpose of aiding the legal system and the judicial process. As publishers, we always look out for subjects and authors that are able to take the discourse on a particular area of law forward from where it stands today. This new book is another small step in the same direction, 
and we will continue to publish more such works ahead as well. On behalf of the entire Ogres team, I would like to thank all our esteemed guests, esteemed guests on the panel today, along with the audience. And I would also like to thank our strategic partner, Lawyered, for helping facilitate this event today. I wish you all a great evening ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dhani. May I now request Mr. Shubran Shupari, Advocate on Record Supreme Court, to give the vote of thanks, please. Honorable Mr. Justice Sanjay Kishan Kaul, Judge Supreme Court of India, Ms. Zia Modi, Founder of AZB Partners, Mr. Arvind Datta, Senior Advocate, Mr. Darayas J. Khambata, Senior Advocate, May General Nirendra Kumar, Sri Vikesh Dhyani, and Ms. Priya, Priya Dashini, ladies and gentlemen. It's my privilege to have been asked to propose a vote of thanks on this August occasion. At the outset, we offer a gratitude to Honorable Justice Call, who has taken time out of his busy schedule to release the book. One interesting fact I came across is that Justice Call, while deciding the case of a 44-year-old litigation between government entities, had lamented on the explosion of dockets which had clogged up the courts. To make his point, Justice Call had quoted a letter written by Mr. Nani Palkiwala to Mr. Soli Sorabji on his appointment as Attorney General wherein he stated that the greatest glory of the Attorney General is not to win cases for the government, but to ensure justice is done to the people. This is the ethos that government agencies must adopt to minimize litigation and reduce delays. On a lighter note, if I may just state, as a counsel for the state, whenever a matter is listed before my Lord Justice Call, the first thing we check is uh, whether there's a delay in the matter and what's the reason for the delay, as it should be. Uh, uh, we thank you, sir, for joining us today. We are extremely thankful to Ms. Zia Modi <clears throat> for gracing this occasion and sharing her thoughts with such great difficulty. Uh, she had also authored a book on the 10 cases that changed India, wherein she had discussed about the attempt to overturn the Keshavnan Bharti judgment, which was opposed by Mr. Palkiwala. It is widely known that his performance in court on that day was advocacy at its pinnacle. Ms. Modi has referred to the failed attempt as a moment when the Supreme Court chose uncertain democracy over certain tyranny, a thought which we may have to consider in these times as well. I would like to take this opportunity to also express our gratitude to Mr. Datar, who has shared his views on the lessons that lawyers <clears throat> can learn from Mr. Palkiwala's life. As someone who has briefed Mr. Datar on some occasions, there are a lot of lessons that young lawyers can learn from Mr. Datar as well namely his humility, his demeanor in court, and his legal erudition. We thank you, sir. We express our gratitude to Mr. Darais Kambata, who elucidated on the impact that Mr. Nani Palkiwala had on post-independence India, and Mr. Palkiwala's contribution to the country as a whole, and not confined to the development of constitutional jurisprudence only. We would also like to thank Major General Milendra Kumar, whose vision has come to a fruition in this present book. Major Kumar has himself authored several books on Mr. Parkiwala, and his contribution to the centenary celebrations is immense. The book in itself is a celebration of life of Mr. Parkiwala, seen through the eyes of several legal luminaries who have graced the centenary's lectures and functions. I also extend my warm thanks to Mr. Vikesh Dhyani from Oak Ridge Publishers for bringing this wonderful creation to life. I extend my thanks to the coordinators of the webinar and the viewers and participants for attending this webinar. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Have a nice weekend. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Major General Kumar. Thank you. Thank you.